遠い遠い未来ミュータントや魔物がうごめく夜の世界の物語Ten thousand years in the future, we have crumbled. We blew each other to hell. The madness of mutually assured destruction finally writ large across a scorched earth, and crawling from the ashes with only survival on our minds, we abandoned our humanity. We forgot civilization and found only savagery in its place. It was the vampires that stepped out. Out from their caves and their crypts and their coffins, and under those nuclear clouds, decided to rule what was left. Whilst we had long forgotten their many weaknesses, they remembered everything the old world, the technology they had once feared, and they claimed it for their own, turned it on us. To the squalling, stupid babes of a new humankind, they were nobility, terrifying in their advancement. And for a while, we abided their tyranny. For a while. As humanity regrew their spines and rediscovered their resolve, they began to fight back. But they needed champions, warriors, who could stand up and face the nobles and their wretched armies. They needed. vampire hunters. The intoxicating, apocalyptic world of Vampire Hunter D might just be the long running series' biggest draw. When author Hideyuki Kikuchi thrust his titular character into the fight for the first time in 1983, the brutal, fantastical, weird science world around him came into focus all at once. A naive people, struggling with found technology they no longer understand, the world exists in a strange limbo between the cultural infancy of its present. And the awkwardly appropriated occult science of its past. Cybernetic horses ferry frontiersmen from town to outpost. Gothic castles sprout from distant hilltops with medieval menace and blast intruders away with automatic laser sentries. And throbbing force fields protect farmland from simple vermin. Kikuchi is nothing short of prolific. His list of works is intimidating, with plenty of famous anime adaptations spawning from them. Such as Demon City Shinjuku and A Wind Named Amnesia. Despite this, he has largely dedicated the last four decades to bringing this strange world to terrifying life and etching the legend of his eponymous vampire hunter across it. Working with renowned artist Yoshitaka Amano, who is best known for his elegant work on the Final Fantasy series, the two brought Dee's world to stark, beautiful, terrifying life over countless novels and short stories. With such a strange melting pot of genres at the series' heart, with elements of gothic horror, science fiction, and the western, amongst others, it was ripe for adaptation. To bring its eclectic vision to new audiences in new mediums. It notably went on to inspire many facets of Konami's Castlevania later in the decade, birthing a celebrated franchise that would continue to pay homage to D for decades to come. But it only took two years for that inaugural novel to hit the theatres as a deliciously violent, salacious 80s action flick. Perhaps D had lost his nerve because he stood stock still instead of holding his sword at the ready. The women gazed at him intently. Their facial features were distinct, but all were equally beautiful, and the red lips of the three women twisted into broad grins. He looked at them, and they at him for a few seconds. With the sound of a torrent of drops, the three women rose in unison, 
Their heads came up to the height of D's, and then above his, far above. Who in the human world could imagine such an amazing sight? It served as a progenitor for a lot of the pulp cinema that would follow, and helped define a movement that targeted irresistibly unsavoury anime at adults, at home and in the West. It's a genre famed director Yoshiaki Kawajiri mastered with the likes of Ninja Scroll and Wicked City, another adaptation of a Kikuchi novel. Kawajiri is a visionary in visceral animation, propping up his bloody tales with just enough tantalising story beats to take us from one violent set piece to the next. It made sense then, that when D was let loose on the cinematic world 15 years after his subversive first outing, Kawajiri was tapped to reintroduce us to the legendary vampire hunter. Bloodlust was released at the turn of the millennium, honouring Amano's beautifully elegant artwork balanced by the romanticism of Kikuchi's gothic world, and painted red by Kawajiri's eye for lightning-fast action. As Japan's fiercest talents converged on the project, Bloodlust staked its claim as one of anime's finest action flicks ever made. The mysterious D is a Dampier, a human-vampire hybrid who has his feet in both worlds, but who belongs in neither. Hated even by those who hire him to rid them of a vampire menace, he cuts an imposing, beautiful, but lonely figure. Powerful and mysteriously gifted, D is uniquely capable of cutting down the nobility and their throng of fearsome beasts. As bloodlust begins, he takes up a new contract to rescue a young woman who has been abducted by a noble, or to kill her if it's already too late. It's a simple premise, one that belies the many nuances of a tale dripping in melancholia, found only in the best of vampire fiction. Bloodlust understands the core duality of vampirism, bringing it to life not only in Dee's mixed heritage, but in the haunted creatures he hunts. It's the beating heart of Bloodlust, and it's a movie that plays not in narrative black and whites, but in the complicated shades of grey in between. Greys that have long played host to the most interesting tales the genre has to offer. It's in this bittersweet storytelling that Dee is allowed room to breathe as a character. A luxury he was never afforded in the straight-to-the-point 80s classic, and he proves to be a complicated beast worthy of exploration. Racing a rival gang of vampire hunters to the bounty, D finds moments to evolve in his status as their professional frenemy. Seeing his resolute badassery from their very human point of view effortlessly grows his legend in our eyes, and as he begrudgingly becomes closer to members of their crew, we learn more about both parties. The ragtag group of highly skilled mercenaries are all fascinating in their own right, but it's their set of unique powers and skills that allows Bloodlust to put on a show, with each inventive fight one-upping what came before. Kawajiri's best-known works have always balanced lightning-fast bloodshed with impactful editing and a use of colour and light that is second to none in the medium. Every frame of his blistering battles visually pop and it's this aesthetic that is key in selling every slice of an Adachi, every crossbow bolt shredded through a target, and every reality-rending blast of a hand cannon. I worried initially that the move to widescreen would, for whatever reason, hamstring the tightly packed, almost claustrophobic verve that made these scenes so exhilarating in the past, but I needn't have worried. It's his best-looking feature to date, using every inch of that new real estate for even more exciting cinematography, dramatic camera movements, and wicked close-ups. The heady mix of Bloodlust's iconic imagery and the swelling gothic score sell the brooding, atmospheric film in a way that gave me goosebumps time and time again.
When it was all over, I was tempted to immediately go back and rewatch my favourite scenes even as their many impacts were still ringing in my ears. Instead, I picked up Kikuchi's first of over 40 novels. It was my only choice if I wanted to keep hanging out with the enigmatic D in his rich, detailed and engrossing world. Somehow, Bloodlust is rarely mentioned in the same breath as classics such as Akira and Ghost in the Shell. It never marked the start of an anime franchise the series so clearly deserved. Instead, it's long laid dormant, waiting for an oft-rumoured rebirth that has yet to emerge from the grave of Kawajiri's finest feature. He truly surprised me with Bloodlust, teasing out a wonderful narrative without ever sacrificing the breakneck pace that makes his pictures so thrilling. It's a testament not only to his evolving filmmaking, but also to Kikuchi's delicate prose that gives as much time to tragic romance as it does its bloodiest battles. The result are action scenes full of characters you genuinely care about, and narrative arcs spanning decades that you're wholly invested in. If you've enjoyed either of these movies, I'd wholeheartedly recommend you take to the books as I have and find yourself a new favourite, with hundreds of hours of content to lose yourself in. But Bloodlust will long remain a high point for Vampire Hunter D. It imbibed the series' beating heart and emerged as a standout in all regards. As Kawajiri's best work to date, as a pinnacle of action cinema, and as a fascinating entry into the ever-evolving gothic library of vampire storytelling. As always, thanks for watching. This video was a heck of a lot of fun to work on whilst I chipped away at a much bigger upcoming project. A classy look at sex, erotica and pornography in anime and manga. I'm aiming for it to be out in September, and worry not, it's a tasteful video that I intend to be surprisingly safe for work, but even the most carefully edited piece about hentai might not make it past the prudes at YouTube. There's a chance I simply won't be able to upload it to the main channel, or YouTube at all for that matter. So with that in mind, I'd advise following me on Twitter, or even pledging a buck over on Patreon to get notified of when it goes live. In fact, it's down to my patrons' generous pledges that this video was funded in the first place, so if you have an issue with me going horny on main, feel free to take it up with them. If, instead, you think I should drop the smut and stick with vampires, hit the like button and I'll continue to make videos solely about horror's least lusty monsters.